You're listening to episode number four of the Indie Film Tribe podcast with me, your host, Angela Matamocha. Welcome. Welcome, welcome, Indie Film Tribe. Thank you so much for being with me here. With me uh, here today, I am super, super duper excited to introduce this lady to you that I have on today. She is an award-winning writer, producer, director. She has done production design. She has worked on all sorts of projects: uh, short films, feature films. And she has a few uh, projects um, in the pipeline right now, which um, I'm really excited to have her talk about. Ladies and gentlemen, Linda Palmer. Hi, Angela. Thank you. That was very sweet. (laughs) (laughs) Thank you so much, Linda, for being here. So let's just jump right in. I'm really curious because you do so many things, writing, directing, and producing. I just want to start by asking you, what is it that you love the most about being a filmmaker? You know, it's funny. I really, really do enjoy writing because it all starts there. Yes. And it's um, it's really something I can do by myself wherever I'm at in the world. You know, you just have a thought and you just start developing it. And and so I, I love that sort of just working on something very loosely on my own and helping helping create it. But through the whole production process, I think the thing I've found that I love the most is production design. <laughs> I know that sounds super weird, but I just love, I love the idea of getting together with another creator, another director, producer, whatever, writer, director, and really helping them create what they envision, that world, um, the world of each of the characters, um, and just try and make it look as realistic and, and as possible, you know, so it's something that was really weird. I I started out producing and then um, I had hired some directors to direct some of the stuff I was doing. And uh, because I wasn't as um, confident in myself as a director that I could do it. I'd written before, but I had not actually directed a feature. I directed commercials. So um, when I did that a couple of times, my, my directing partners at the time were like, you probably should consider directing because you're very involved. But I was a designer and I, I really enjoyed just helping have a voice in it. You know, I think that that's one of the things there's, there's about, there's that initial creative team that you need, the director, producers, designers, cinematographers, um, and, and I love being part of that team. It's usually a shorter, shorter involvement. I'm not there from, you know, the very beginning of writing to seeing it land in distribution. I'm there just for, you know, maybe several months before and then after the shoot. And then I I would have time to go to something else. So I think that's why I like production design so much. And let me ask you this. What did you do first? Did you first start writing or did you first begin with production design? Oh, no, I've been writing forever. That's, that's the thing that I, like I said, I really love to do that. It's, it's very, I can do it wherever I want. Um, the production design, I need to really be working with other people and helping them, you know, achieve their dreams. So, um, so, you know, I've been writing forever and, and I actually started producing in order to um, make things happen. Because I found that when i you know, I, I'm producing out of necessity. This is wonderful that you say this because I think a lot of writers fall into this trap where they are writing and they love writing, yeah. but they're waiting for somebody else to give them the green light to make their script come to life. Yeah. So yeah, I love I, this sort of do-it-yourself attitude that you had about your writing where you just decided yeah. to produce yourself. Is that why that came about? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I I really tried to go the route of trying to find an agent, trying to find a manager. Um, and generally, they don't want anything to do with you unless you have something to offer, like a sale or something. So um, at the time that I started producing, I was working in a different field. 
and I had um, money available to me because I was actually working. Okay. And um, so I and I did really well in, at my career, which was sales at the time. So um, so that afforded me to do a lot of the things I wanted to do in film. So, so absolutely, you know, I, I, and, and I I actually look at at producing as like project managing. If you're really good at organizing projects and keeping them running and doing things on a budget and everything, then you have the skills to be a a good producer. It's just a matter of the level of it, you know, whether it's a short film, a commercial, a feature film, obviously it takes longer and it takes more people that you have to manage. And, and it's just a, you know, the project just gets bigger. Now, when you're producing, or let me backtrack, when you're writing, because you have this experience as a production manager, yeah. as a producer, do you write with production in mind? You know, I probably do now more than I ever have. Um, I did go through that period, obviously, before I produced anything where I was just writing whatever came to mind and budget wasn't really an issue. I just was writing out of whatever my ideas were. But I think that once you come to a point, I mean, at the time that I first optioned a script from a writer and I produced that that story, I did three projects before I did my own where I optioned them and I produced them. And I think that um, a lot of that was because I wasn't comfortable directing up front, you know, and I also wanted to learn so because I didn't go, I didn't necessarily um, finish film school. I have a certificate from UCLA in their extensive um, extension program. And I have a uh, degree in journalism, but not necessarily filmmaking. And so I really believe that the best education you can have during it is actually making a film, is actually doing. I think you learn so much more. So, you know, it, it took me a couple of films to realize that I really wanted to be more involved creatively in the look of it and in, you know, choosing the talent and putting the whole thing together. Now, when you direct, because you're a production designer, do you also hire a production designer or do you sort of wear two hats when you're directing a film? You know what? I, I, I do both and I don't hire another designer um, just because I feel like, the designer works so closely with the director in the times that I've I've seen it uh, really work where they're just trying to well first of all in a bigger film you need somebody diff- you need somebody different for that position because generally there's going to be a lot more speaking of budget you know a lot more things to handle but because the films I had done before were all in that low budget I, I would even say micro budget um, I did it myself because we couldn't really afford to have a production designer. And also I knew that I was capable of finding something that I saw what my vision was or what I saw. And and that's as a producer because I didn't direct those films. Those were the ones I, that I generally uh, just produced and they had a different director attached. But then when I started directing, then the first one I did was Halloween party. And, you know, I, I know you don't know it, but we're huge Halloween fans and we have huge parties every year. And I we saw the cows. trick or treat. <laughs> I was like, trick or treat. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So we have huge parties every year. So we had a lot of everything that we needed. So it wasn't like I needed a designer. I knew exactly what I wanted, you know? And so I, I feel like, um, there's a, a big action adventure picture that we're doing next or it's in the works right now. And one of the things I do want to do on that is production design. I mean, if I were going to go in and sell it to somebody, I'd say, yeah, you can get a different director, you know, you can, you know, whatever, but I want to be the designer. So that's a, that's a big part of the attachment that I want with that project. Hmm. Awesome, awesome. That's such a wonderful skill set to have, production design, because I know, and maybe you've experienced this as well, especially with some of the micro-budget feature films Mm -hmm. or just short films, uh, a lot of first-time filmmakers don't really pay much attention to production design. Do you find that to be true? I think that that's a, it's one of the last things that people think about. They don't really, I mean, they, they have an idea of something, it it's one of the reasons that it's really good to have, uh, especially a director, um, create a lookbook so that the whole team knows what the look is that that 
um, leader or the visionary of the film kind of sees? What do they want it to look like? What color schemes do they see? You know, how, what are they going to do in color correct? Because it might be totally different than how they shoot. And, and it really makes a difference with the DP as well. I mean, the DP is going to ask the same questions, you know, um, when they're doing test shots and everything. So the more you can give somebody, the better it is for the whole team to understand. And I think that it's just a really, you know, I don't see myself ever production designing like huge space films or, you know, things like that. I'm not necessarily as... um, I don't know. That's that's not the kind of thing I want to do. I'm really my my style is much more like a Nora Ephron. So I live more in like present day sort of stories and really um, just comfortable spaces. So I think a lot of it is what does the space say about the person? What does the furnishing say about the person? What are the colors that they choose for their walls or the things they wear say about a person? And and that's the kind of thing that I really like when I read a script is really feeling like what's going to make that character stand out a little bit more to give you an idea in my short film, our father, I also designed that and I had a very um, specific thought in mind. It's about a family that is taking care of their estranged father who has dementia. And it's really kind of an abusive story in the sense that, that he was never part of their lives and now they're taking care of this man and it's, it all takes place in a bathroom. And so you're in a really small space, but the family really is, it's hurting the family for him to be there. You know, it's, it's, uh, it's abusive to them. His behavior is abusive to them. And so um, I knew I wanted the space to seem clinical. Mm. So it has kind of tinges of, of a green and white, um, you know, to give it that kind of look. That was done a lot in Color Correct as well, as well as my DP and I talking about about it. But also in the design of their clothes, obviously they're just wearing regular jeans, T-shirts, you know, whatever. But um, all the colors, colors they're wearing are the colors of bruises. So you don't necessarily, like, pick up on that. But um, also in the Color Correct, we desaturated it. So we took some of the the color out of the people. So they looked a little sicker. Right. And it's, it's very, very, um, subtle, but when you're looking at it, it, you feel it. And I, I guess that's what I mean by production design. It just feels different. It's not like, um, if I were just going to set up a light in my house and shoot a scene, you know, there's a lot more about it. So that's like an idea of, when I uh, approach something from the production design standpoint, what I'm looking at. That's something that I'm really learning a lot about right now. I'm currently in post on my first feature film. And for me, it was a, you know, a very micro budget film. And, you know, I'm kicking myself now as we're going through everything for not focusing more on production design. And just in twiddling on my own with different color palettes, it Mm -hmm. blows my mind just how putting a tint of a certain tone completely changes the feel. Yeah. It's it's amazing. So yeah, yeah, I can't wait to do another film just so I can spend more time to focus on production design. Well, you know, some of the really cool things that, that you see are like the difference of seeing like film noir as you know, and there there definitely are, are certain styles that that when I see a film, I'm much more drawn to films that all clearly all of that's thought about, you know, yes. there's, it's, they're so rich in so many elements. You can't pinpoint what it is. The music's great. The color's great. The, the, um, set up the shot of the shot. It, it, you know, it's, it just all works together. But I think it's that it's definitely that key team that, that, when they when they're working together and they're working towards the right vision, yes. which is why a lookbook's so important, um, I think that it's definitely distinguishable between first time filmmakers and filmmakers they have a little bit more experience and they want or a little bit more money and they actually, you know, say, No, oh, that's a job and I really need somebody to do that. 
I am sold. I am definitely doing a lookbook for my next film. I did <laughs> not on this film. And again, with each project you learn, you get better. But yeah. um, that is definitely one of the top three things that I know going into my next project that I didn't know. Now, yeah. let me ask you about this, especially about producing, because you are a writer that wanted to get your scripts made, you started to produce. What would you say for you was the most difficult thing when you first started producing your own scripts? Um, I think that the most difficult thing for a lot of people is money. Yes. You know, I think that um, finding the funding to do it and the right project to do is, is really difficult. The very first thing I did, I funded myself so that, you know, that took that away and it, and then it was just really about, um, I want to see, I, I'm trying to think on that very first thing I did. What we were doing is we were shooting the f opening 10 pages to create um, basically something to sell or to show investors to do like a million dollar film. So literally the first 10 pages set up what the, f the focus of the film was. And then it also served as a short. Um, that was the first time I, and we did shoot in film. We shot in 16. Oh, wow. So that, is, that had its own challenges because <sighs> just the whole process of being in post is much different in film than it is now. So um, I think because I didn't know all of that, the post part was the most difficult for me. How did you overcome these the difficult times that you had in post on your first project like was you know, it your team was it just sort of making mistakes and continuing on what how did you you know I I always hire people that know a lot more than me a lot more than me and I hire the the best person I can um afford for the position and sometimes that person might be new and they haven't done it but they're willing to learn and they're willing to work with you. I, um, I hired a, an editor on my first feature I directed. His name's Scotty Simmerly. If you look through my work, he's edited everything I've done since. And we hit, we just had such a great relationship. He actually calls me like his West coast mom because he's from North Carolina. <laughs> and, and, um, but he's, he's like old enough to be my son. So he, he's very young. And I think that, Halloween Party was the second feature that he had edited. He had edited, no, he edited a documentary feature, then another feature, and then Halloween Party. And I was a little on the fence because I, like I said, normally I hire people that have a lot more experience than I do. And I do have some friends that are editors that have done a lot of work, but I felt like Scotty was the right person for that, you know? And I have gone out, I have in many cases hired new people to do something where I felt like I needed a lot more energy and a lot more pos positivity around it where they would keep positive and up. Um, so that had a, that had a lot to do with it, but he's a phenomenal editor and he's got nominated at a lot of festivals for his editing for a variety of, of work. Um, so obviously he was a good choice. You know, he, he was, he's really good at what he does. Um, and, and once you have somebody like that, it's you now I understand or I, I started really understanding then why you don't let those people go, why you keep just building your team and finding the best people that you can to keep working with you uh, from project to project. And then it just gets easier. You know, you have a shorthand with people. They're used to the way you work. So. Yeah, I hear that loud and clear. I already know the editor that I'm working with right now, where he's going to work on my next project with me. Yeah. And, it, and it's such a special and very um, important relationship. Oh, yeah. I have been in situations where, you know, someone has asked, so who do you think is a good editor? You know, did you like this person, mm -hmm. like that person? And it, what's so interesting to me, just because let's say you and I vibe really well with a specific yeah. editor, the next person might not. So that's yeah. always very interesting to me where someone's like, is, is it, are they good? It's like, yeah. yeah, they're good, but that's not the real question. The real yeah. question is, are they that's good true. for you? And are they good, the, the right person for this project, like you said? Yeah, that's that's absolutely true. Because you know what? Um, 
and it's it's almost a per project thing. I had, uh, in fact, the one thing that changes quite frequently in what I've done is the composer, because composers aren't, aren't always necessarily available for your next thing. But um, each composer that I've had in each of the projects has, well, actually, I want to say, with the exception of one, most of them have been newer musicians, so they don't have a long list of, of credits. But they've been phenomenal in what they offered that particular project because they were so into it. Um, the composer for our father, who's been nominated for and won awards for our father for the music for it, um, he found our film on Indiegogo and started basically trying to talk to me about hiring him as the composer on our father. And he even um, offered to do some free pieces for me to use in some of our trailers. And at the end of the day, I mean, here's this great musician that really believes in the project and he was doing the stuff and, and just because he loved the, the, the story. And so he was the best person for it, you know, and, so I think you do, you do, like you said, have to really find the best person for the for the project at the time. And I'm so glad you really spoke on the fact that uh, your editor was a new editor, your composer was maybe not as experienced. That's exactly what I'm experiencing right now with my composer. She mm -hmm. is uh, she just graduated last year, I believe, and she's done a couple of shorts, but because mm -hmm. this is her first feature, she is so excited about it. She gets yeah. the story. She loves it. And I'm telling you, she is the perfect composer. So yeah. I just want to point that out just so people listening can maybe really be open to talking with new editors, with new composers. Yeah. Just because a person has 10 years experience, which obviously experience is very important, but I, I also think it's very valuable to be open to talking to new people. Yeah. If they're talented, yeah. they're talented. And if you're a director, all you have to do is direct them and just speak in a yeah. way, you know? Yeah. And again, rather than a lookbook, give them samples of the kinds of music that you're thinking about. And then they can go off and create amazing music. I remember the um, composer that worked on Halloween Party for us, um, Zuzu. We had mentioned, my husband and I, because he was one of the producers as well, had mentioned um, some music that we thought we wanted it to be like. And so he went away and he did something similar to that to that point. And it, and it wasn't really what we wanted. We had given him the wrong direction. <laughs> and, and he goes, but it, but this is, and we were like, no, that's not really it. He goes, but you were saying that you want it. We're like, okay, we were wrong. We don't want that. <laughs> you know, so you have to, the more clear you can be with somebody, all of these musicians are incredibly talented. Yes. And, and so, you know, it's not necessarily that the talent's the question. Exactly. It's exactly what you said about are they the right person for the project? And do they, you know, do they want to put everything into it that you would like to them to put into it? Oh my gosh. Yeah. I, I, I'm telling you, and I know for, I, I love the entire process of just working with different people and see how they kind of interpret your story. Um, mm -hmm. And maybe because I'm like knee deep in it right now, but as you know, like once you add a color scheme, it completely changes the feel And then the score. Mm -hmm. That's like a new feel. It's almost oh, yeah. each time that the script is being rewritten with all these yeah. elements that are being added. And it's like, wow, I, that's what I made really cool <laughs> I know, and it's so funny because you know I, I find that when you write it when I'm writing I have visualizations of what I think it's going to look like and then when I'm on set and I'm directing the set experience is, is really just addictive anyway because there's so much creativity happening yes. and it seems like you can stay up for hours and days and and it's just you, you could run on that adrenaline for so long. And then when it's over, you're pretty much dead. dead. And you need to take a little bit of time and kind of, you know, get your yeah. re-energize yourself. And then what I love about post is it's so calm compared to the rest. A lot of times I haven't had deadlines that I had to meet. So it's just when I thought the project was was finished. And generally, we, you know, we're in post anywhere from, hmm, on a feature, probably like three, uh, I want to say three to six months. Yep. 
you know, and it's generally done by then with all the tweaking and asking, you know, other producers or keys, their opinions and that stuff. So, um, so yeah, energy, energy is a big thing. They just have to be the right, the right people for it. Absolutely. Absolutely. And this is um, sort of a perfect segue to the next question I wanted to ask you. Um, as you know, you know, here at Indie, F- Indie Film Tribe, we're all about creating socially conscious content. And one of the reasons I find that to be important is because when you approach people to work on a script with you um, to be a part of your team, I have personally found that people are so much more willing to maybe work for a little less, maybe spend a little more time because they are so connected to the piece. Mm-hmm. Have you yeah. experienced that? And what kind of projects are you inspired to start creating or in creating now? Well, I, I really decided to change my direction. Um, I want to say this last year where I, I, I made a statement out there in the Facebook world <laughs> where I said, um, you know, I, I want to do uh, from now on, I want to produce or direct projects that have some sort of social impact or, or meaning, you know, where they can change things because as you and I were talking about earlier, it takes so long to make a film for me as an independent, um, producer, director, writer, um, from start to finish, writing the film to delivering it to a distributor that could take two to three years. That's two to three years of my life that I'm dedicated a a large, large part of my time to making sure that that film is going to find an audience and it's going to get out there. It's not just going to sit on a shelf. And so I'm really, you know, involved in the marketing as well, but I have to really care about it to put that much time in it for that long, you know, and to keep up that level of excitement about it. So it doesn't just die off. You know, we were talking about the adrenaline that you have in production. Well, you have as a producer where you own the project and you have to see it from start to finish, either optioning or whatever to delivering it, you have to have that excitement the whole time, you know, to, to get, to even get buyers or, you know, sales agents or whatever interested, it can't just die off. So, um, so yeah, it uh, that's why I want to do things that that make a difference. Oh my gosh. Linda, thank you so much. This has been just so valuable and and I knew it would and so interesting. Thank you so much uh for your time and I I can't wait to talk to you again. <laughs> well, thank you Angela. It was really nice to talk to you too and good luck with your film. Thank you so much for listening, Indie Film Tribe. That was part one of a two-part interview, and I'll be sure to let you know when we post the rest. Thanks so much. Bye. (laughs) 